it was Christmas Eve, a little girl was with her grandmother. They were in the Christmas Eve service, and she had already opened a couple of gifts that morning, and she didn't get what she was looking for, so she was holding out that maybe after the service she would get that gift, or maybe it would be the next morning before she'd be able to open what she really was hoping for under the tree. She didn't really uh, want to bother with church, so to speak, but she was there with her grandmother because she had to be. Grandmother gave her a coloring page and said, just entertain yourself a little bit. Don't make a lot of noise, and you'll be fine. Maybe you'll get your gift when we get home. Service starts. Pastor steps up, and he starts to pray. And all of a sudden, he says, God, thank you for your presence. The little girl kind of alerted. She leaned over to a grandmother and yanked his arm, and she said, maybe I'm going to get it here because the pastor just said, God has presence here. <laughs> you know, Christmas Eve, we come to the, our, our Christmas time, if you will, we come with a lot of expectations. Every year, without fail, we all have expectations of what we're looking for for Christmas. Well, I'm convinced that Joseph had some expectations and we're going to see in the text, as we work our way through it, that they were unmet expectations, if you will. Uh, his plans were interrupted. His plans were changed. Uh, but I am certainly glad that God's plans prevail and not ours. With that, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. We're going to continue in Matthew's account of the Lord Jesus' birth. Beginning in verse 18 and follows, here's how it reads in the NIV. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. When Jesus woke up, excuse me, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit whom you sent to teach. Would you allow him the freedom to speak to each one of us this day right where we are so that we might better understand this indescribable gift that we call Christmas, the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his precious and soon coming name. Amen. Amen. So there are four things uh, in the text that I'd like us to look at today that might better help us understand uh, what Joseph was processing uh, during this time and also the significance of the gift that bears the very name of this church, Emmanuel. So the first thing in the text we see is a pledge. The first thing we see is a pledge. Look at the very beginning of verse 18. The Bible records, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Uh, it's important that we understand what it means by a pledge to be married because as we look at the text, it actually uses words like bride, like husband. It even uses the words divorce quietly. Uh, why would there be a need to divorce if they're not yet married? 
So we need to understand what it means so we better process what the angel was saying to Joseph and why it was of such significance of what a pledge literally means. So to be pledged to married in ancient Hebrew life would be far more binding than our modern day engagement. It's kind of what we analogously refer to it as, that Joseph and Mary were engaged. However, it doesn't carry the same meaning that it would carry if I were to say, well, our youngest is considering getting married and soon she'll be engaged. It wouldn't be this. That's not true, by the way. Uh, if she's single. If she's watching this, she'd say, well, Dad, what are you talking about? No, that, that's not a true story. Just an illustrative purposes. Uh, but a modern-day engagement pales in comparisons to the commitment level and the legal bindedness that surrounded the pledge in ancient Hebrew marriages. There were two stages to Hebrew marriages. The first is referred to in the Hebrew as Kedushin. And Kedushin is the betrothal period. This is when a groom, at least the family of the groom, sometimes it's the groom, but in more cases than not, it's the family of the groom, uh, works with the family of the bride, and they agree that these two are to be married, oftentimes without the consent of the bride and groom. Uh, in many cases, they've never met each other. My friend, Dr. Babu and Dr. Sally Naringer over in India, the ministry that we support they, there, they told us about their marriage and said it was a lot like the ancient Hebrew arranged marriages. Babu said, I met my wife once uh, before we were to be married, and then several months later when it was time to get married, I remember praying, Lord, when I pull her veil back, please let her be pretty. <laughs> he said, because I forgot what she looked like. But our families knew the plan that God had for each one of our lives and believed that our plans would intersect and that we would complement each other in our plans and we would have one plan to honor God and they have for over 30 years out in the desert, ministry in the jungle, ministering to their own people. Well, in a similar way, it's likely that Mary and Joseph's caduceum, the marriage, the first part, would have been arranged by the parents of what's referred to as a betrothal period. There's no definitive set period, but many scholars believe this period lasts around about a year. And oftentimes, the one that would be the groom and the one that would be the bride would not actually have interaction with each other. Or if they did, it was controlled and it was very little interaction. This period was typically set apart to test the fidelity of the marriage. Would the marriage actually last? Well, if they could make it through the caduceus, it's likely that their marriage would last. A mohar was given, that's a dowry in the Hebrew, was given from the groom's family to the bride's family in the signing of this contract to ensure that they would be married. Uh, if the groom's family or the groom decided that they would pull out, the dowry would still be given and kept to the family of the bride to cover for any expenses that may have been incurred in the loss of a wedding. So it was really a form of an insurance payment. The second stage of the, married is called, of the marriage is called the hoopah. The hoopah is when they say, hoopah, we're getting, no, it's when they say, <laughs> it's when they say, okay, it's time for us to, officially live as we have betrothed that we one day would. And they would come together in a very elaborate marriage ceremony, and then they would go off and they would consummate their marriage. It's important, and it's pointed out in the text that Mary and Joseph have not consummated their marriage because at this point they are simply pledged to be married. And why is it important that they have not consummated their marriage? Because Jesus, we will learn in a moment, cannot come from the seed of a man. The Bible teaches that Jesus would be born a man, but he was not born of man. In the text, it literally says he was born of woman. This brings us to the second significant thing we see in the passage. 
First there's the pledge, and then there's the pregnancy. Look at what the Bible says about the pregnancy. It's no ordinary pregnancy. Second part of Matthew 1 and 18 reads this way. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. If you turn over to Luke later on today, turn over the Gospel of Luke, you'll read a little more in detail about the supernatural birth. But what we need to understand here is that Matthew is being introduced to, although he wouldn't understand it to be so, he's being introduced to what we call the incarnation. This is when divinity becomes flesh. The divine steps out of heaven and comes to the earth and clothes himself in humanity. Now, obviously, as we read about the joining of divinity and the joining of flesh, the hypostatic union is also there, as in that flesh and divinity become one. But what's accentuated in this passage more than the hypostatic union, the joining of the two natures, is the significance that Jesus was born of human nature. Why is it important that Jesus would be born of human nature? The reason this is important is because Jesus had to be born under the law. Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. He writes, but when the set time... In other words, the time that God predetermined. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. The Bible makes very clear when Jesus came, he came as a human by way of a supernatural birth to a virgin named Mary, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by man, so that he too could be born under the law. And if you recall, when Jesus was speaking in one of the Gospels, he said he didn't come to remove the law, he came to fulfill the law. And just as he fulfilled the law in him, we can too. And there we find salvation. We also see that Jesus had to be born of a woman, be born as a human, because all sin requires a blood sacrifice. Therefore, the divine had to become human so he could become the perfect sacrifice the sacrifice that would be necessary for the sins of the world to be forgiven. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, here's how it reads. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. He goes on in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, and talks about Jesus being the fulfillment of that promise, that he was born to die. The reason that God sent him was on the greatest rescue mission ever so that you and I could be removed of sin, that sin could be done away with today, and please don't Take me out of context and misquote me on this. But I'm convinced, based on the authority of Scripture, that sin's really not the issue anymore. The issue is faith. You either believe it and it's applied to your life, or you do not believe it and it's not applied to your life. But as far as the payment of sin, it's already been taken care of. It's a finished work at the cross. Past present, and future sins. They've all been done away with because Jesus Christ lives. And because he lives, sin is done away with. But a supernatural pregnancy was necessary for this to take place. This is why it had to be God 
who would touch the virgin to bring about a child and not another man. I want to encourage you to go back later today or sometime during this holiday season and read Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 helps us understand why Jesus could not be born of man. If you'll recall, in Romans 5, Paul teaches that sin entered the world through the disobedient act of one individual. Now, if you'll notice, he was referring to Adam. The Adamic nature is fallen. Therefore, everyone that has been born of man, that's all of humanity, minus the Lord Jesus, who was born conceived of the Holy Spirit, that means we all inherit the sin nature because sin passes through the Father. The seed of the Father, sin passes. That's why it says when Adam sinned, death entered through him, and through this one act of disobedience, all have become disobedient. Even before we choose to do wrong, the Bible teaches that we are born in this disobedience. Therefore, David writes in the Psalms that while he was being put together, while he was being knit together, even in his birth, that he was sinful. But just as Adam, his sin tainted all, so in Romans 5, Paul teaches the glorious promise of Christmas. And that is through the one good act, righteous act. That is that Jesus would die on the cross, would be buried in the grave, and then raised from the dead. That through this one act, anyone and everyone who would believe could be forgiven of their sins, begin a relationship with God, and have the hope that when this life is over, to experience eternity in his presence. It's a supernatural pregnancy. God became man. We see a pledge, we see a pregnancy, and then thirdly in the passage, we see a plan. Technically, in the passage, we see two plans. You remember Any of you remember the old television show? I, I, I maybe date myself, a little, date myself a little bit. I grew up with it. Had Mr. T with the old starter kit chains around his neck. Uh, A-Team is what it was called. Remember the A-Team? Remember who the head guy was? His name was Hannibal. Anybody remember what his favorite saying was? Mr. T. And Mr. T was there. That's right, Terry. Anybody remember what Han Hannibal's favorite saying was? I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> I, I didn't see who that was, but bravo. Yeah, there you go. I love it when a plan comes together. Well, Joseph wasn't so happy at the moment because his plan was about not to come together. But God's plan was about to prevail. So I want to show you two different plans. Matthew 119 is Joseph's plan. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. This was Joseph's plan. Now let me give you a little context around this. That, that might help out, and I'm going to use a little bit of conjecture, so I want to make it very clear that I'm inserting a little conjecture, so I want you to go back and read through it and discern for yourself whether this could be it or not. Now, what I mean is the angel has not spoken to Joseph at the moment. If you take Matthew's account and you take Luke's account and you sandwich them together, in all likelihood, I'm not stating that this is how it happened. I'm saying in all likelihood, Mary could actually be visiting Elizabeth while this event is going on. You say, what do you mean? So what we do know is that Joseph is aware 
of what is, he's being told is likely to happen. So somebody had to tell him. The angel hasn't spoken to him yet. It's very likely when we read Luke's account and look at it chronologically, Mary's already had the visitation from the angel, and very likely she went to Joseph and said, hey, I know we had plans, but let me tell you what this angel said to me. And I can only imagine, based on the text, how he responded. So it's very likely that while this is going on, Mary could be visiting Elizabeth at this moment, which we read about in Luke. Now, it doesn't change the narrative. If she's not visiting Elizabeth at the moment, it's just fun to study the history wrapped around it and look at maybe how it could have been. So very likely she mentioned to Joseph, he's processing it. They need a little space. They're not spending a lot of time together anyhow because they're in a betrothal period. And what we know about that is they're not together a whole lot during this time. So she's likely out meeting with her cousin, which we read about in Luke. And then there Joseph is alone. Whether she's with her cousin or not, he's still alone. And he's trying to process this news. And then all of a sudden, in his spirit, obviously it was his flesh, not the Lord leading. He determines that he's going to divorce her quietly. Again, indicating how binding the betrothal period of ancient Hebrew marriages was that he would divorce her quietly. According to the law, he could have her put to death. So there must be a level of love or commitment that he has determined in his heart for Mary, the one that was betrothed to be his bride, or likely he would have said, just take her away and stone her. But instead, it says he wants to divorce her quietly. But God intervenes. And God steps in. And in verse 24 and 25, we see that when he wakes up after interacting and encountering the angel, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife. It's important, verse 25 too. Don't write that verse out of the text. It says, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. It was important that they did not come together sexually, that they were not intimate until after Jesus was born. So that no one could say that this birth took place through a natural union. It had to be a supernatural birth. So God, even though Joseph had another plan for a moment, God's plan continued to prevail, and it had all of us at the heart of his plan. And that is that redemption through this supernatural birth would be made available to all who would call upon his name. Now I want to pause just for a moment before we go to the last point and begin to wrap up our time. I would be remiss as a pastor in a Christian church today if I did not address that the text certainly recognizes and presents that marriage is a special covenant. Marriage is a covenant that the Bible teaches God established in the beginning of time. If you read the book Genesis, the word Genesis literally means beginning. And as God established he, the creation, he made man. And then he said it was not good for man to be alone, but he made a helper suitable. The word suitable in the Hebrew literally means different. <coughs> it means that he would make another creation, not exactly like man, but that would be different from man. So when they come together, they would complement each other. They would complete each other. He made woman. And he put man and he put woman together in the context of marriage. And he said, this is beautiful. <coughs> Just this past week. And before I say it, let me clarify. I'm making a biblical statement. Not a political one. 
Just this past week, our president signed into law what he's calling Respect for Marriage, the Respect for Marriage Act. I think it should probably be called the Disrespect for God Act. And what I want us to please understand that as a church, we will always honor marriage as God established it. And we will not recognize a marriage outside of which God established. Now, please also hear this. What I did not say is we don't like people that are not like us. What I did not say is we do not hate those who don't think like us. We should never accept their lifestyles. Whoever lives contrary to God, whoever, in, in any way, the Bible teaches it's wrong to live contrary to God's word. With God's help, we need to live his word out. It's what he calls us to do, to be conformed into the image of Christ. Christ fulfilled the law. We're to live as he did, with his help. And we're to build relationships with people that don't like live like us in very safe places we're to build relationships so that when given the opportunity we can speak in love the truth so what I would like to do just for a moment before we wrap this message up is spend just a moment in prayer would you pray for our country in the tough shape we're in surrounding this topic of gender sexuality and marriage just take a moment right where you are and you pray and then I'll pray as well God, we need your help. One of the most prosperous nations on the planet. And it, when it comes to just everyday living, we seem to struggle to get it right. Would you bring revival to the church? To me, to us. To the church all over. Then to our land. And would you put people in places of authority to make decisions on behalf of this great country that love you and that live for you? God, please protect our children, our children's children, the generations coming behind us. Help us to teach them the word that they might learn to abide in Christ And live it out, regardless of what culture around them does. Please be with us, Father, as we move forward to still be a light, even as the world around us gets darker. Help us to shine brighter. And open up doors that we might lead people to experience the life-changing power of the Lord Jesus. And live life as you designed it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, parents and, and grandparents, if you have kids and teenagers, I just want you to know that um, Pastor Jordan and the student ministry team are working really hard with a, a Christian sexuality course that we hope to offer for our middle and high school students in the new year sometime. Uh, they, they'll get you plenty of information out ahead of time, so you'll be able to look through the information, and we'd love for you to get them signed up whenever that's available to make sure that we're teaching here at the church God's plan for the family Because unfortunately, they're not getting it in a lot of other avenues. Um, So be in prayer for Jordan and also our student ministry team. Final point in this message, a promise. We also see a promise. Look at verses 20 through 23. But after Joseph had considered this, this was considering uh, leaving Mary. It says, after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive birth, 
will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in your notes, if you don't already have it there, the promise that we get from Isaiah here that that God gives through the prophet Isaiah is found in chapter 7, verse 14. Very significant um, Christological promise. And there are two things, at least on the surface, that we see that are imported of this promise. And that is that this baby, this God-man, this child from God who is God, His name is to be called Jesus. In the Greek, that's Joshua, which stems from the Hebrew word Yeshua or Yahweh. And it literally means Yahweh saves. So every time we look at Jesus, we see God and his promise to deliver salvation. So the angel is informing Joseph that you will be used along with your wife to bring about God's promise of all the ages to bring salvation to those who would believe. When we see Jesus, we see Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of promise, the God who promises salvation to all who call upon his name. And then finally, we see that he's to be given the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when we see Jesus, not only do we see salvation, but we can also rest in security because our salvation is in him. We can be sealed. We are sealed Because we are saved, so we can be satisfied because we are secure. He has taken care of it. And not only has he taken care of what comes in our next life, because he is Emmanuel, he is with us in this life. Jesus will walk with us. He will talk with us. He will go with us. About our day. Grandmother was sharing this with her little grandson one time. And she said, so is Jesus kind of like Andy? And grandma said, son, I'm not sure what do you mean. Is he kind of like Andy? He said, well, last time I was over here and you were teaching me about Jesus, you taught me that song. Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. (laughs) Yes, son, Jesus is like, and he will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for delivering on your promise. I pray for those that know and love and have received this promise that you would continue to grow us all the more to be the way you designed us to be to live according to our new name, Christian. But also pray for those who've never opened the gift of Christmas, that this might be their year, Lord. Would you please open the spiritual eyes of those that understand this message and allow their sins to be forgiven and their home to be heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.